Um, I just wanted to thank you so very, very, very much for being such a big fan of the X-Files. Hey, Valerie, it's Annabeth Gish. Happy, happy birthday and happy x fest -versary. Hey, Drew, it's Dee Wallace. How are you, my friend? Hello to the Hill Street, Hill Street, Hill Street Blues Group. I'm trying to say that 10 times in a row. I got uh, contacted by your daughter, Caitlin, who loves you very much and is very proud of you, as I am for your service to the community. Hi, Bonnie. It's me, Stephen Weber, uh, and I am a gift from uh, Mary Beasley to you, you lucky, lucky lady. Hello, Alondra. It's so nice to, well, speak to you in this video greeting. Thank you so much for um, reaching out to me, and I'm happy to reach out to you. Happy birthday, and again, thanks for being a Wishmaster fan. Happy birthday. Hey, Alex and Munchkin, thanks you so much for being an X-File fan. Hey there, this is Dennis O'Hare in Paris. A happy birthday, Sarah, from Nick and Zoe. Hi, the Street Blues fan group, thanks for watching. Hello, Alfredo, it's Billy. Great pleasure, I'm so glad you're such a fan of Titanic. I am too, I have to say. Hey, Garrett. This is Barbara Crampton, and I want to tell you that you need to finish whatever creative project you're working on. Uh, Eric Freeman, the garbage guy. Yeah, yeah, the garbage guy. And thank you so much for being such a great fan and friend. Hey, everybody. Am I coming in loud and clear? Thanks so much for tuning in to another Full Empire Promotions live event. I'm Dominic, as usual. I'll be your host for this special Q&A with Alex Esso. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter via Full Empire Promotions. I thank you to everyone who's watching this live. If you have any questions you'd like to ask Alex, uh, please drop those below, and we'll get to those during the broadcast. In addition, you can get uh, you can have your own private conversation with Alex, and she'll be doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, video chats on Zoom uh, directly after this Q&A. Those will start at 5.30 Eastern time. In addition, you can get personally signed photographs directly from Alex. For all that and more, please visit FullEmpirePromotions.com. Now, I do want to uh, drop a little disclaimer that Alex is in a hotel now to do this. And the Wi-Fi is not uh, the greatest. We did a couple tests, and it seems to be okay. But if there are some glitches, uh, you have to excuse us. We're, you know, we've got the best connection we can for her, and uh, we're going to try to power through this. She's also in another country, so we've got that as well. But uh, uh, before we bring Alex on, let's familiarize ourselves with uh, some of her work. Only one thing in this whole world that I want. And they're gonna give it to me.
She's caught the attention of genre fans with an enchanting performance in Starry Eyes, and since then has taken the genre by storm with roles leading up to tackling the iconic role of Wendy Torrance in Dr. Sleep and tugging at her heartstrings in the dark love story, The Haunting of Bly Manor by Mike Flanagan. Other credits include The Neighbor, Tales of Halloween, Red Island, The Drone, and most recently the film Faceless and the upcoming Netflix series Midnight Mass. Let's welcome on the talented uh, Alex Esso. Alex. Hello. How are you? Ahoy. I'm, I'm great. Some Quarantining those... right now? Yeah, yeah. I did let people know that uh, before you came on that you're using hotel Wi-Fi. So yeah. that to excuse uh, us if there's a little glitch here and there. Not the best. But so far, so good. It's, it's holding up, so. Yeah. So um, what have you been up to? Anything exciting? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. I've mostly been just like taping auditions and, uh, you know, playing PlayStation. Yeah, you know, the usual actor, <laughs> the usual actor like duties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we've done a couple cons uh, or one con this year. A couple, couple more coming up. So it's good to see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good to see it's things. Exciting. That was fun. It was nice to see the gang. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'd like to start off by uh, talking a little bit about your your beginnings. Uh, most people may not know, uh, but you were born in Saudi Arabia. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I was born in a compound in Saudi Arabia called Dafran, which very, I mean, I don't know, pride is the right word, but I'm pretty proud of this. It's the same compound that Chris Christopherson is from. No, no, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I can't wait to meet him one day and tell him that. I like have an in if I ever get to meet him. Yeah, it's going to happen. It will. <laughs> so, so what was your first taste of the arts? And uh, did you watch a lot of films growing up? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, well, I watched movies a lot um a complete cinephile um but my mom was also a stage actress so i grew up going to her rehearsals and plays and grew up in theater and just just kind of always there even though it's not i mean i didn't want to do that necessarily i was just so steeped in it for so long initially i wanted to be a painter wow yeah but so, oh, there's no yeah. money in painting, not like acting. Yeah, that's true. Well, I guess because <laughs> it depends that's a joke, on what, kids. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on what you paint. Oh, I, you got a little uh, tinny there for a second. I couldn't hear you. I said, I guess, I guess it depends on what you paint. Can it's you weird. Hear me? You sound you sound like a robot. Is that? Is there is anybody else hearing that? Do I sound okay? Is anybody else hearing that? Maybe, hold on, I'm going to grab some headphones and see if that fixes the problem. Do I sound okay yeah. to everybody watching? Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah, Alex, I think it might be on your end. Everybody's commenting saying I sound oh my okay. God. I think it's just the Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, you sound like a robot in disguise. Uh, hey, any better? Yeah, yeah. It's better now. Good. Ah, just when I grab my my buds. Okay, well, keep them keep them handy just in case. I, yeah, but I I think it's probably just a connection thing. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I thank God that was fixed because I was like, it's, I think it sounds okay on my end. I've I've, I've had my oil today, so you know, yeah, didn't sound too robotic. <laughs> So, um, so what were some of your favorite films growing up that you remember watching a lot? Oh, where to begin? Um, well, I mean, Labyrinth and The Dark Crystal and anything that Jim Henson did, I loved. Tim Burton as well. Uh, uh, also, like a lot of 80s comedies, like Weird Science and Sixteen Candles and... You know the Disney, the Disney uh, catalog back when they made really good movies. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, I grew up kind of on, on you know, I'm a big Leslie Nielsen fan, so I like yes, yeah, Naked Naked Gun Gun movies. and and yeah. uh, Police Squad. Yeah, Police Squad was the best. 
Yeah, like Breakfast Club and some of those ones. That that's too. That's not you know. That's too not immature enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So so what what do you recall? Um, was the first notion that set you into pursuing acting? Was there someone on screen that that uh, influenced you or off screen that kind of pushed you in the right direction of of pursuing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my mom initially. Of you know, just because I was, I was around it so much, but it's almost been like a series of movies that kind of over time cemented not just wanting to act, but the type of acting I wanted to do. Um, but God, I mean, a big one, the biggest one, and this was later, this was like, you know, when I moved to Vancouver to go to acting school and stuff. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, everyone's heard of this, but A Woman Under the Influence mm -hmm. by John Cassavetes. Um, Jenna Rowland's performance in that, and her performance in, in everything, but especially this, uh, I hadn't really, it hadn't really occurred to me how far you can go with acting, the, the, the depths to which you can, you can delve until I saw that movie because it's so seamless, her performance. You don't, I don't feel like, oh, I'm watching an, an actor act impressively. Right. I'm watching a woman have a nervous breakdown and I'm seeing like the ugly reality of, of what that looks like. And, and that was really like the thing that I was like, that's, that's it, that's the stuff. Um, Especially now when acting is, you know, modern acting in, in these newer generations of actors, it seems to be a lot of like, who can cry soonest or the most or who can, I, it, 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 there's no awkwardness. There's no like ugly human awkwardness, you know, it's always very polished to me. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, there's no, not a lot of realism. You know, it's very. I like to use the word sterile. Yeah, it does. It feels very sterile, very homogenous. Yeah. You know, this sort of natural acting has been taking over, where everybody delivers every line the same way, and everybody has the same subdued emotional reactions to things. And like, I remember, you know people like to bitch a lot about archetypes, archetypes in stories and oh, it's full of archetypes. Like the archetype is a very useful sure. storytelling tool. The thing that makes something hackneyed is an actor not breathing life into that. You can do, you know, the shy girl and her outgoing best friend in a million different ways, if you are brave enough. And if you, you know, but I mean, now it's more success based. No one wants to step outside what's already been designated as successful. Right. This was really big. So let's make 10,000 more of them. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to take risks. Yeah. And risk looking stupid, which like what else is our job exactly? <laughs> I, I joke a lot of times when I talk to like film, fan, you know, fellow film buffs. That's kind of serious. Where every Netflix movie or TV series starts off with like a drone shot of like a forest or like the town, and it's like, <laughs> and they all use the same kind of light filter. Yeah, they shoot everything the same way. Yeah, all the mid-sized shots, the close-ups, the extreme close-ups. When they edit back and forth, it, it's it's such a formula and how could it not be i mean netflix turns out hundreds of shows <laughs> it's yeah it's crazy you know thing and now you know occasionally they'll hit the mark with something like uncut gems because the softy brothers are like we're filming on this camera we're using our dp it's gonna it has to have our aesthetic or we're not doing it which right. is great and i have a lot of respect for those guys right or, or they find a Mike Flanagan, you know. Who, who or they find own, a Mike Flanagan, yes. His own exactly. style. Well, his own filmmaking style and his own storytelling style. And 
what's cool about Mike Flanagan and what I think a lot of people don't realize since he works in, in the genre of horror so much is what a classic film buff he is. Like, all that jazz is his favorite movie. And I don't blame him. I mean, if you guys, if no one out there has seen all that jazz, it's one of the greatest films ever made. Yes, it's, it's yeah. brilliant. It's uh, it's about Bob Fosse, the famous choreographer, but it's also directed by Bob Fosse, and stars um, uh, Roy Schneider. Yes, as uh, as Bob Fosse, but it's <laughs> and Jessica Lange plays Death, and that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great film. There's there's a beautiful uh, Blu-ray out from Criterion. Yes, uh, yeah, Criterion put out a wonderful edition of all that jazz. Yeah, well, we'll get back to Mike Flanagan in a bit, but uh, yeah. I do want to talk about uh, a film he did in 2014 called Starry Eyes, which oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> most genre fans, uh, you know, got introduced to you that way. Uh -huh. and, and what do you recall about how you were approached for this role, and uh, what were your thoughts when you first read the script? <laughs> Well, uh, approached is uh, a very generous word. <laughs> um, my my first agent, very, very, very small agency, found this project on Kickstarter and they had like an open call and myself and 30 to 40 other girls all showed up at this place at the same time. And I did my audition I hadn't read, we, none of us had read the script or anything. I just had a couple scenes. So I was like, oh, okay, like horror movie, you know, I wonder if it's a slasher or if it's a blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I gave a okay audition. <laughs> it's not the best audition I've ever given. Um, but then I got snuck into the second round because something about that, it resonated with the casting director and she like brought me back in and by then I had read the script and I was in love with it and I was like oh my god and I and I remember going in for the callback and saying like no no you guys don't understand like I know exactly what references you're making in this film I've seen all the films that this is about like I can give you what you're looking for so, and then I had to meet with the director for coffee so that they wouldn't go with someone who had a, a higher IMDb rating than me. Do you remember the scene that you did in your audition? Was it was it the bathroom stall scene where you're where you're losing your shit? No, the the first audition was um, the scene with myself and my roommate Tracy in the kitchen where I'm like eating the yogurt. Okay. Um and also a monologue which is not in the final cut of the movie it's part of the original ending that was rewritten and reshot okay. um which the director doesn't like me to talk about because he's like no i don't want anyone to ever see that but i'm like no but you have to it's like an urban legend now like the other ending which is you know they made the right decision <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah, the ending's pretty, pretty good. Uh, you know, it's a shame yeah, they didn't they was... didn't put the as a bonus feature, didn't put the original one like on the Blu-ray. You know, as, as a bonus feature. But I think they should absolutely do that because it's pretty funny, and I have this crazy monologue that I give to like all my hipster friends, and that's what I had to do for the first audition, and uh, and then for the second one, it was it was was it it was the Tracy scene, and then. And then it was one of the Hooters scenes with my, oh, sorry, Hooters, Taters. Yeah, they Big couldn't taters. say Hooters. Yeah. <laughs> Big Taters with <laughs> my boss. It was one of those scenes with Pat Healy, the, the great Pat Healy, my, one of, still one of my favorite people. That yeah. guy's so good. He's so good. He is. He really I would is. give anything to work with him again on something. Yeah. Well, we're going to check in some comments here, some of your fans watching. Oh, Nessa's, yeah. wa Nessa's watching from uh, Germany. Oh, so my God. Natural beauty. Girl, uh, thank you. And then... I put makeup on today. There you go. And then you got chicken tenders watching. Is there a correlation, <laughs> is there a correlation between race and IQ? Oh, my God. What? <laughs> we'll get back to that. <laughs> <gasps> what an inflammatory question. Right? All right, chicken tenders. It's enough. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not touching that with a ten foot pole. No, no, no. So no. you're watching from Brazil? Wow. 
Hello from Brazil. Oh, hi, sweetheart. It's so good to see you. This chick uh, would tune into a, a live stream that I would do with a friend of mine. Every, every week we would, we, we would do like a, a weekend of double features and we would have like a theme and talk about them and talk about all kinds of other stuff too. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I, I think I've tuned in on a couple of those. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, you have. Yeah. 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 Uh, Josh Palace is watching. Alex S.O. is a truly iconic artist and a brilliant performer. Performing with the story eyes is a masterpiece of horror art. It's totally classic. Good deal, Joshua, Josh. thank you. Yeah, and I believe he's in Zoom like, with you coming up. <laughs> I don't even I don't even know what to say. That's that's really a massive compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the thanks for the comments, guys. If you have any questions, drop those. We'll we'll bring those up. Uh, I do want to ask about the uh, makeup effects for Starry Eyes because this this is yeah. pretty extensive prosthetics. Uh, it's funny. I was just thinking about uh, our our FX makeup guy on that uh, brilliant man named Hugo Villasenor. It's from Guatemala, and he's like a big teddy bear. He was like completely my rock because Starry Eyes was my first feature. I'd never been a lead in a feature film before. I was like model number one or you right. know girl who brings coffee <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> that's an important role though the coffee it is yeah they need their coffee for the scene they need something to do so but so i you know and it's a lot of work i mean it's a it's early days long hours i would get pre-called like by five hours sometimes because they would have to do full body makeup and prosthetics and man, he just kept me so calm and grounded because I spent so much time in the makeup trailer and God, he was just the best. He's just the coolest guy. I can't yeah. say enough good things and, and brilliant. And he, he's been working a lot. He's been getting some really good stuff. I'm really proud of him. I really, I hope I get to work with him again too. Yeah, that's great. He, he did amazing work on that. So I'm glad he's, yeah. he's kind of taken off as well. The, the, uh, the green eyes, were they contacts or was that CGI? Well, both actually. They wanted me to wear these contacts, which were like absolutely torturous. Like the even the cataract lenses were so much more comfortable. These were like like it was like I felt like I had gritty rocks in my eyes. I kept like blinking. Mm -hmm. They're like, we're so sorry, just we need it for the shot. Blah, 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 and they do it, and then they end up CGIing them anyway because the contacts were too dark. And I was like, yeah, yeah, they probably probably should have did that start. Well, but this is uh, movie making. It never goes that way. <laughs> it's never. It's like Murphy's Law on every set I've ever worked on. It just in in one way or another. Right. Yeah, it's just the nature of the beast. Well, Starry Eyes is sort of a, a prime example of uh, life imitating art. Do you do you feel <laughs> in any way that actors are well, reborn? To an extent. Yeah, it is absolutely. Yeah, you, not quite. <laughs> Do you feel that actors are reborn in any way when they reach a certain level of fame? I don't know if reborn is the word I would use. I I, I get a little cynical about about the subject just because I, I feel like fame kind of ruins actors as opposed to the other way around. Um, I feel like the majority of actors, once they reach a certain level, they kind of start to get lazy and sit on their laurels because and this does happen especially in this culture of celebrity once someone establishes themselves in one thing as good then that will just they can ride that for the rest of their career because they were really good in their first movie or their first right. two movies and then you see like you know as they get more things as they're the lead all the time and they're gracing the magazine covers and everyone's chitty chatty then they kind of start to pick like this niche and then they not niche but a you know a, a shtick and they just do that all the time there i've also noticed this strange pattern where like male actors once they reach a certain level of fame all speak with a new york accent <laughs> even if they're from canada or san bernardino or something all of a sudden they're all from like queens or Williamsburg or something. After a while, they they all they also start playing themselves over and over. Right. And well, because I mean, everyone is telling you that you're the shit all the time. 
oh my yeah. god you're so gorgeous you're so talented you're so brilliant it, uh, you know and, and you're just surrounded by sycophants yeah you're in a little bubble you know you never fly economy ever again and everyone kisses your ass all the time and that goes to people's heads it just does you get used to being treated a certain way and then you always expect that even if you're so off base so up your own ass and it's an interesting thing that happens psychologically where with celebrity worship where you know even the the person themselves doesn't truly know if their motivations are pure or not because they're so blinded by right. this person whose work that they love and why wouldn't they be i mean i actually met jenna rollins once and i forgot my own name for like a second she asked me what my name was, and I was like, it's Alex. So I, <laughs> I love you. You're the reason I'm an actress. I love you. You know, so I, she could have told me to go and eat garbage, and I would have done it. Maybe I wouldn't have done that. I'm a kind yeah. of a germaphobe. <laughs> kind of a germaphobe. Yeah, but, depends, depends you know, hungry, I, I mean, I was her prisoner in that moment, <laughs> you know? It's 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 a strange it's a strange thing. I I think somebody should do like a case study on what fame does to the brain. Yeah, I think I think that would be a great constant Netflix doc. Validation, yeah, constant validation, freedom from consequences. You know. Yeah, you lose touch with reality in a way. Yeah, well, and, and you you start to believe your own hype. Like, oh, maybe maybe I am better than everybody else. Maybe there. Maybe I am more special than everyone else because I'm on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll know the first time somebody meets you at a convention and they forget their name. You'll know you made it. <laughs> right. Oh God. Then you, then you can tell them to go in garbage. I will. She was so nice and sweet about it too. She was just the classiest woman. That's awesome. I was. I was and am not worthy. That's awesome. Well, we'll go back to Starry Eyes just to wrap up on that. Uh, sure. when, you, when you first saw the film with a live audience, uh, do you remember where it was and what the reactions were? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't let me see it until it premiered at South by Southwest. I was like, why? Why are you doing this to me? Wow. So I saw it for the first time at midnight for South by Southwest Midnighters. It opened the Midnighters portion of the festival. Um. Gene Simmons came to the screening because his son had like a very small cameo and you'll see him in Starry Eyes. He's in the party scene and he's like five feet taller than everybody else. Like you can see all of our heads and like his head is cut off. Oh, <laughs> uh, really, really sweet dude though. Really nice guy. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I was, I'm so nervous. I was wringing my hands and I was, my palms were sweating and I'm just like, oh my God. Oh my God. I don't, I have no idea. And then we watched it and, and, and the, the reaction seemed pretty good. Um, and I was, I don't know. I was just so like, <sighs> it was so dreamy, you know, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was the craziest experience ever. Are you are you an actor that that has an issue watching yourself on screen? Yeah, oh, I found God, mo yeah, most it's are. Horrible! It's horrible! It's so unholy, you know. And I'm not a, a religious person by any means, but it's really like something about it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I you're over over you over critical of yourself. Yes. I guess, at times. Yeah, of course. Well, because I mean, you know. I want to watch my golf swing, you know? I want to see, like, did I believe that? Did that work? And sometimes the answer is no. Like, I've done movies where I watch and I'm like, no, no, I should have done this instead. I should have done this. And it's, you know, that's a good way to learn. You just have to get past, like, seeing your face and listening to your voice. Right. It sucks. <laughs> Well, you worked with a plethora of genre giants on Tales of Halloween, uh, including Lynn Shay, Barbara Crampton, Mick Garris, and the late Stuart Gordon. Um, how, how fun of a shoot was this? The set had to be a fun it environment. A, it was great. It was so great. I, I, oh my God. I mean, I love Mick Garris. 
Me too. He is a brilliant director and a total gentleman. Um, and I felt bad because Stuart Gordon is like everything to me. He's one of my favorite directors and people. And, and I was just like, oh my God, I love you so much. And I saw your stage plays and Dolls is my one of my favorite movies of all time. And and oh my God, everyone. So Barbara Crampton walked up to me and introduced herself to me. It's like, hi, I'm Barbara. I saw you in Starry Eyes. I thought you were wonderful. And I was like. Yeah, she's, she's a sweetheart. She's, I think it's so sweetest. cool that she, she loves the genre so much. She's the sweetest woman ever. I, I, I'm always happy whenever she's in something or doing something. She's producing now. She's producing yeah. movies yeah. with a, a really good guy, Bob. Bob Portal, who I worked with on this movie called Fashionista. I'm really excited to see what they do. Yeah, do you remember, uh, was it was it just a quick shoot where you were on and off on Tales of Halloween, or did you guys yeah, interact? Yeah, it was like two days. Was it? Okay. Yeah, it was It was really two, well, two or three. Maybe it was three days. But the the that group scene was all in one night. Sure. Oh, and I fell madly in love with Lynn Shea. She's like oh. the coolest woman. How can, how can you not? She's so cool. Like, she's so cool. I'm like I'm try. I really want you to like me and think that I'm cool too, Lynch. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's so awesome. She's she's yeah. and she's hilarious as well. Yeah, yeah, she's so funny. Well, Stuart was one of my clients, and uh, you know, a good friend, and and I miss him. But um, what would you say is your favorite film that he did? If you had to pick one, Dolls. Dolls. Wow, Dolls okay. is my favorite. I mean, I love Reanimator, and I mean, I love a lot of his movies, but. Dolls is like so special to me and it's so funny. There's so much humor in that movie. Like it's so it's almost like it's almost like a movie that he made for his inner child. Yeah. You know, it, it's just it's the most charming horror movie I've ever seen. It really is. It had it yeah. has a very gothic fairy tale. Kind yeah. Of vibe to it. But still like there's still something very light about it even though people die. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Like it's yeah, there, there's it's it's a very not cynical horror movie. Yeah, I think my favorite was Castle Freak. Oh well, yeah. okay. So yeah, Castle Freak is a very very close second. Just just, be, means... just because I, I think it's his most raw film, and, and there's no yeah. there's really no comedy at all in it. No, no, it's almost the opposite of Dolls. Yeah, so yeah. that's that, that's my favorite. I haven't yeah. seen the remake yet, but I didn't uh, know they did a remake. They did a remake of Castle Freak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm hearing mixed things. Uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll check it out eventually. Who who directed it? Uh, an effects guy, Tate uh, Steinziak. He was an effects guy. He did Face Off, and what? Um, he directed the Puppet Master. You know, okay. not not a reboot, but it was like a Puppet Master continuation. Oh, uh, one of the sequels. Yeah, it was it was like a Fangoria, uh, uh, Cine, I forget the name of the company, Cinepix or oh, was, I didn't see that. Alessonier's Alice company. Huh. Like, they made that. I really love the second one. Yeah, back in the day, the old school of Yeah, sure. the second one's so good. Sure. Well, Axel Carolyn directed you on Tales of Halloween, and she's been yeah. trailblazing the genre as well. She's killing it. I'm so proud of her. What What do she's you like about working with her? Um, I mean, I don't know. She and I kind of speak the same language. It's very, very easy to communicate with her. And it's very easy to understand what it is that she's looking for. Um, she's also so calm. Like, she never loses her cool. Even when problems come up, she's very focused. She's very disciplined. Um, and she's very, very warm. You know, as as a person, because we're 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 friends as well. I consider her a friend, and and you know, I just I don't know. She's like a bosom buddy, and she's into the coolest stuff. I mean, we have a ton of things in common. So, yeah, I, I I'm really excited to see what kind of stuff she does. I would really love to see her direct another movie. Well, she has one coming out that I'm looking forward to called The Manor. Yes, uh, yeah. starring Barbara Hershey. Yes. So. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it should I'm be. I'm excited to see that. I remember reading the script for that. It's going to be so cool. Yeah, there really aren't many uh, a dominant female genre directors. So I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, which direction her career goes in. Yeah. 
I mean, well, honestly, with Axel, uh, I, I don't know if like her being a woman is going to make that big of a difference. You know what I mean? Like, she just is someone who has the chops. Sure. You know, and that's really what I like about her. She's that's, just like does it, you know? Yeah, you can tell she knows the genre, and she's you know, yeah knows it well. Yeah, she's like a genuine fan of the genre. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you worked on a film called Midnighters, and it was yeah. directed by Julius Ramsey. Yeah, and Julius. He was, he's primary uh, a TV and uh, TV director and TV editor, right? Of yeah, well, most notably of The Walking Dead. Sure. And he directed one of my favorite episodes, like in early on. It's 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 the the standalone. Um, uh, Beth and oh my god, how am I Daryl? Excuse, I, I kept wanting to say Dylan. The Daryl and Beth like standalone episode is one of my favorites, and that's actually what made me like so excited to work on this with him. And he's a really great dude, really cool guy, very smart. Coming from TV to directing film, did you notice? Did he have any kind of different approach to the way he he gave you direction as opposed to film directors? Um, no, I thought he gave very good direction, very clear, very concise. Um, I think there's a, a huge difference between a network show and an indie film. And one of the biggest things is scheduling. When you're on a TV show, it's a well-oiled machine. These are all people who've been working together season after season. They all have their jobs, you know, directing Oh, sorry, I shouldn't put that in air quotes, but directing an, uh, an episode of a show is not the same as directing a film. There are way more things in place for you on a TV show. Um, you're working regular hours, regular days. You start at nine, you end at five. It's very regimented. On an indie film, there's no rules. There's no, like, you know, SAG has some guidelines in place, but it, it's very different, and you have a bunch of people together that don't know each other like you have the people you bring and then you have the people you hire locally and right it's 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 a lot more challenging right so and we shot that in we shot it in 24 days we should have had like 36 days <laughs> the our i think our last shooting day was like 21 hours or something like that wow. which is which wow. is which is indie filmmaking. That's that's what it is. It's crazy. It's it's being cold all the time, not getting enough sleep, working insane hours, and eating mostly terrible food. <laughs> so you really <laughs> weren't mid you really weren't midnighters. Yes, we were. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a that. But 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 it was a labor of love, and I really liked the people I was working with, and you know that's what saves projects like that is how cool the people are. Sure. So. Do you ever have any aspirations of directing? I, I used to direct theater before I moved to uh, L.A. when I was, like, 20. I, I had this theater group. We would write and direct different plays and things like that, and that was really, really fun. Oh, cool. Was, was, this, in, was this in Canada? This is in Vancouver, yeah. Okay. And then I also had a writing partner, and we would, you know, write and direct and produce short films for, like, short film festivals or things like that. Um yeah, it was really fun. Awesome. Well, we're in, I want to mention briefly a film we did called The Super, because you worked alongside Val. Oh, Jones. my God, yeah. Uh, did you interact much with Val? I No, I didn't even meet him once. No? Oh. Well, we were our schedules were never in the same scene. We're never, like right. I, They shot my stuff, I think, a couple weeks before he even got there. Okay. So, yeah. Which is fine. I actually made another movie called The Neighbor with those same producers, which is why they brought me on for the super. Awesome, awesome guys. So it was it was nice to just go and act and hang out with them. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. I, I see, saw you didn't have any scenes with him, but I was curious if you had met him. I would love to. I'm very curious to, especially now that he's like, the hit, now that his pendulum is kind of swinging back into a kind of healthier place, it seems. Yeah, it was it was weird. I saw a film he did called The Snowman. I don't know if you saw that. No. It was, it was about the serial killer that kills people and puts traps their heads off and, and builds a snowman but puts their head on the snowman's body. What? And uh, Val Kilmer is the, the detective that's consulting with the detective that's doing the research, and his voice was dubbed. 
Like when I watched it, I said, "That's Val Kilmer, but that's not his voice." Oh, yeah, because of his, he, he lost his his yeah. voice box. Yeah, and that was the last thing I saw him in. So I'll have to look and see, you know, what else he's done. He's done things since then, but that yeah, was my and I, I thought he had some kind of surgery to fix that. Yeah, supposedly he's better now. I mean, I think he's, yeah, he's he's. I oh, he was going like in a deep Orson Welles territory for a yeah. while. Yeah, and I was worried because he was so talented, like and beautiful. Yeah. Like when you see him in Top Secrets, yeah, <laughs> he can act and sing and dance, and his comedic timing is amazing, and he looks amazing. And like you kind of you have to wonder, like, dang, was it fame? Did it go to his head, as it does with so many superstars? Is that pride? Pride cometh before the fall. Exactly. Was he his own Huckleberry? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have Sam watching. <laughs> That's just my game. <laughs> we have Sam watching. She says Homewrecker was one movie that had me unsettled from the get go. I'm curious how it was oh. filming. That. Um, I'm so glad you asked about that. Um, that was a grind. It was a grind and a half to film that movie. We shot it in. We shot it in twelve days for like seven or eight grand <laughs> um and it's mostly just myself and this other actress precious chong just beating the crap out of each other so homewrecker has many meanings <laughs> in this movie <laughs> um but and and again as i described like being too hot being too cold not sleeping at all because you know we didn't have a makeup artist we we're doing our own makeup we didn't have wardrobe we we're doing all our own wardrobe we were doing all our own set deck I was I made some paintings for the movie like while we were filming I'm like painting these paintings to go in the background like it was bananas and there's a bunch of stunts and it's crazy I, I had to sleep for like a week when we were done filming that wow you really do have to love the, the you love your job to be an actor <laughs> yeah you really do yes you have to be like any yeah you got to be like a little bit of a masochist like there has to be something like that because derision is such a huge part and rejection you know sure yeah it's like the big part of it i want to mention briefly a, a film i really enjoyed you did called red island uh it was an indie you film you saw that I, I did it was an indie film but the camera <laughs> the camera work makes it look like a you know a three million dollar film it was just the yeah. angles and the shots. Uh, where where yes. did you shoot this? It's uh, well, it's directed by a DP. Oh well, that explains it. Yes, um, and a very talented DP. I mean, he. I had worked with him a few years prior uh, on like some little rom com something, um, and then again on another movie about ecstasy, where I play this like schizophrenic in this mental institution, which was fun. Is small part, but it was really fun to do. Um, so that's why he hit me up. And this was like, we started with six people, and by the end, we had four, five, including myself and the other, because there's only two actors in the movie. Right. right. Um, and we just went into the forest and shot this thing. Where was it? Where was it filmed? Um, it was filmed up in Squamish. In uh, it's it's like an hour north of Vancouver. Okay, well, that was beautiful. It was shot beautifully. Beautiful. Oh yeah, it, it, it's beautifully shot. You know, and I I was really happy with with working on that. I was happy with the work I did on that. Um, they surprised. They they that was another one where they completely redid the ending, but they didn't tell me that they were doing that. So when I actually saw it, I was like, oh. That's that's what happens. <laughs> wow. Hmm. It was interesting. Um so I yeah, I but but man, that was that was a crazy experience too. I mean that right. was crazy. Yeah, well it's a it's a beautiful beautifully shot film. Yeah. So anybody who hasn't seen it, I think you can watch it on Amazon. Yep, it's on Amazon. Oh my God, that was like a different lifetime. I feel yeah. like. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great film. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, Dr. Sleep, of course, and how you stepped into the role, the iconic role of uh, Wendy Torrance. Was this your first time working with Mike Flanagan? And when did you first meet him? Uh, yeah, so yeah, this was, this was my first time working with Mike. Um, I met him, I went up for like two weeks of prep uh, and then like a couple days of shooting and then I had like a month off and then I came back and shot the rest of my stuff um, after. And uh, I met him the day I arrived in Atlanta and we just hit it off like gangbusters immediately because he's another film nerd and we're both huge shining nerds. Like I, I can't, I can't overstate how much it meant to me to work on this and and play this part. It was The Shining is one of my favorite one of my favorite Stanley Cooper films. I mean, there's some stuff competition, but like her performance in that is is revelatory. It's so honest, and I I don't think anybody working now would be brave enough to make the choices that she made in that movie. The humility it took to give a performance like that. It's it's in my top five for sure. And I actually, I really wanted to meet her when I found out about this, but then I, I saw that horrible Dr. Phil interview with her and I was like, oh my God, like, I don't want to bother this poor woman. If you if you call so, her and, and say you're going to take her to dinner at Red Lobster, she'll talk to you all night. She does, she actually does private signings that I know autograph dealers that they won't, she won't invite them to her house. She says, meet me at Red Lobster, pay for my dinner, and I'll sign stuff. So they do. They they like take it to Red Lobster and they just she signs stuff, talks to them and Maybe they, I'll do that. I mean, I don't have anything that I want her to sign. I just want to talk to her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who knows what she'll say to you, but Right. Uh, well, I mean, I was um there was this guy um that I knew in LA who started a fund for her that I gave to and she ended and, and it would like she actually got the money from it. Like he sent me pictures of him like going and giving her the the money and that she's like okay and they're trying to get her like medical help and stuff like that so yeah well it's, yeah. It's, you know i felt that was the dr phil thing was kind of exploitive but that's oh it was topic. an incredibly poor taste yeah. I, I didn't i didn't know what the point was i didn't know what the point of the exercise was it's not like it's not as if the episode was about schizophrenia right or anything like that. It just felt like she was being paraded around for for ratings or something. Yeah. And 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 it's a shame because, I mean, Shelley Duvall, especially specifically, was always so, so intelligent, so poised, so well spoken. I mean, there was so much to her, you know, that I don't think a lot of people realize. But and I also grew up watching. Um, uh, what was it called? Her like story time show, uh, Shelley yeah. Duvall's fairy tales or right. something, something like that. And, oh, every episode started with like, "Hi, I'm Shelley Duvall." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is called Darling Clementine. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Well, <laughs> you did. I mean, you did a flawless job of of, of putting your own spin on her role and kind of. Thank you, know, you. How did you prepare for that? Did you watch the film a lot, or did you watch her other work? I know you said you watched her her TV series. When I was a kid, I did. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't go back and like watch her do stuff because I didn't. I didn't want to do an impression of her. Right. Um, and honestly, I mean, by the time that I booked this job, I mean, I had already been watching The Shining since I was in high school. I mean, I had seen it many, 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 many times. So when I found out what, because I didn't, when I auditioned for this, they didn't say it was for Dr. Sleep and it was for this role or they, they, they changed the name of the project. They changed the name of all the characters. They said it was for like a WB short film concept for a TV show about kids with powers, you know? Right. Um, interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. So when I found out what it was, I mean, I thought, I thought my heart was going to burst. It was crazy. Um, wow. So, so I mean, I did. I mean, I did see The Shining a couple times after that. Um, partly because when I got to uh, um, Atlanta, uh, Warner Brothers sent over this amazing um, thirty-five millimeter print of The Shining, 
and they rented a theater in Atlanta and screened it for all of the cast and crew before we started filming, which was great. Awesome. It awesome. was amazing to like see it in the theater with the sound and the way, and on 35 millimeter, it, it looks gorgeous. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm in the rare camp that prefers Mick Garris's version over Kubrick's. Yeah. Uh, I love Mick Garris so much, but yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is Mick Garris's version is very true to the book. Yes. Yeah. It's very, it's very faithful to the source material. Um, I would never expect that from someone like Sam Lee Kubrick. Right. It's just not his style yeah. to, to it's, he's the artist. He's not honoring the work of other art. I mean, not, not to say that Mick Garris is not an artist. No, no, I get what you're saying though. It's, it's, <laughs> no, but, but I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's scary in a different way. It's, it's impactful in a different way, but the Stanley Kubrick, has his stamp on it and it has to have his stamp on it because he's an auteur. And if you give him pushback like Stephen King did, then he's going to do stuff like show a red BW bug in a crash <laughs> on the highway. It's his movie. Stanley Kubrick's right. The Shining. It's his cover of The Shining. Right. right. You know, and I, I personally prefer it like if someone's going to cover a song that it sounds a little different than the original. What's the yeah? Otherwise, what's the point? Otherwise, what's the right. point? Right. But yeah. that being said, I really like Nick Garris's uh, version of it very much. Yeah, I, I always say uh, The Shining was a Stanley Kubrick film. The other Shining was a Mick Garris Stephen King film. Right. Yeah. yeah or a TV exactly. series, really. It was a TV movie, but right. Uh, and I mean, you know, Stephen King is very precious with anything that deals with alcoholism because it's very yeah. personal to him and it's a personal struggle, but it's not Stanley Kubrick's personal struggle. Sure. And that's not what he wanted to accentuate in the movie. And I'm glad, I mean, honestly, I'm glad he did. I, I love the simplicity of his shining. I, I love the vision of it. I, I think that he actually conveys so much while doing very little, you know, like her, uh, her monologue in the beginning when she's smoking, and talking about her son and how, you know, yeah, his dad's kind of an abusive al al alcoholic, but it's no big deal. Like we have it under control, and and it's fine, and we're a happy family. Right, right. But that scene is so heartbreaking. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, and I and I like. I actually prefer the fact that her Wendy has a lot more um, fragility than in the book. That's something Absolutely. that I actually prefer as a choice. Um, I think that it makes her journey a lot more interesting. It makes her character arc a lot more interesting because she has to overcome her own meekness and her own self-doubt and her own lack of self-esteem. She has to get over all of that and save her son. And that is very interesting to me to see somebody struggle through something like that, you know? Yeah, brilliant performance. Brilliant. So yeah. good. So, well, do you so recall the, the, the classic scene where the axe is coming through the door? Do you recall filming how many how many shots it took to film that? Was it just one take, or did you have to do it multiple times? Oh, for me? Yes. Two. Oh, wow, only two. Yeah, and they kept the first one. <laughs> awesome. Was it was it actually Henry on the other side, or was it just the stunt no. guy? <laughs> no, actually, our stunt guy called dibs on that. Okay. He was like, no, I have to do it. It has I got it. Like, I just I just love it too much. I gotta do it. And yeah. Henry was like, Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's fine, man. Get it. Yeah. And then everybody him. took a picture at the door afterwards. So I had to stand there with the axe for like another twenty minutes. Yeah, well, you axed for <laughs> it. Was it. Great. Oh man, it was fun. It was it was dizzying. Like I felt high after filming that. Yeah, it's a it's a great film. I I, I encourage people yeah. every every horror fan I talk to go watch it. Oh, and w but watch the director's cut. Just do yourself a favor. Watch the it, it's it's longer, but you don't even notice it. It's yeah. it's perfect that way. That's how they should have released it. They should have released it that way. I agree. It's incredible. They cut out some good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, and some plot points that became that were like erased. Yeah, like the the bathroom scene with you know with Henry and and uh, Ewan McGregor, you know that was that was an important scene. And it's, 
And it's such a great scene between the two of them that their their chemistry is so good. Um, But then there's also this whole thing with Danny's eyes as a child, which is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like it adds this cool element to it that I never would have thought of that isn't in the book. Like there are things that Mike added that really brought this, this brilliance to it. Really like I felt again, like, because it's a cover, it's not the original, like, it's okay to change things if it makes it better. Right. And that's exactly what he did. And he managed to marry the the movie and the book, like the original Kubrick movie and the book. And and I, I, I was just so impressed by it. Yeah, it was perfect collaboration, uh, you know, merger of, of all those, all the things we love about that universe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Did you take any souvenirs from the set or were you given anything? Um, no, <laughs> I got to keep like one piece of wardrobe, but Warner Brothers was really like, <sighs> yeah, no one can keep anything. I think they're going to, they're, I think, I don't know for sure, don't quote me on this, but I heard through the grapevine that they wanted to set up some kind of like interactive um, Outlook Hotel thing overlook hotel excuse me mm. uh overlook hotel where you can like walk in and walk through it and so they kept a lot of the set pieces i think to do that so ho- hopefully they end up doing that that would be really cool that would be awesome they should do yeah. a convention there yeah that would be cool yes i mean man walking through those sets was crazy it was the craziest i had to like pinch myself <laughs> i had a whiskey in the gold room and i, I threw a tennis ball against the wall of the Colorado Lounge. And they matched everything exactly. The same material, the same color palette, uh, the same, this, in some cases, the same provider of said materials, like uh, carpets or drapes or things like that. Walking in the bathroom at two, in room 237, riding the tricycle through the hallway, yeah, it had to be a trip. It was crazy. It was crazy. And then, like, almost overnight, they had to break it all down to rebuild the out the exterior stuff. And you walk in, and it's just like a pile of rubble. Oh. Where, where the Colorado lounge once stood. It was so jarring. Yeah. Yeah, it almost makes it seem dreamlike. It's there, you're it there, is. and then it's gone. It is totally dreamlike. Yeah, it's, it's, it's disposable art. Wow. Wow. Essentially. <laughs> Well, you're right. Anybody who's, who hasn't seen Dr. Sleep, check out the director's cut. For yeah, sure. it's great. You did another project with Mike Flanagan playing Charlotte Wingrave on the Netflix series Haunting of Bly Manor. Yeah. Do you recall how this character was first described to you? Like Princess Diana with Brookfield's okay. hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty accurate. I was like, are you going to give me Brookfield's hair? <laughs> Thank you. That's what I was the most excited for. Well, that and being British. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I loved about the show. That you know, he, he used really good American actors doing really good British accents, right? Which well, you never I mean, you never see. No, well, you know, that's because Americans get a bad rap. You know, we 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 buy into this whole narrative that like all the good actors are from Britain, and now Australia and like American actors are just not as good. You know. Which is funny, and and then this whole thing like Americans can never do British accents, but man, these people have never seen Benedict Cumberbatch bash in what that what Black Black Mass. Yeah, yeah, Johnny Depp, right? He sounded like a British person living yeah. in Boston. He sounded like Whitey Bulger's brother was British. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's you're so right. funny. Oh my god! It's so which is great. Like I'm all for a friendly rivalry with British actors. I'm totally gonna fuel that beef. I yeah, think it, I, I think it only makes everybody better. I just think it should be equal. Like I think if you want to go over and work on Game of Thrones, you should be able to. Oh, oh yeah! Don't even get me started. Well, yeah. Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage was arguably one of the best actors on that show with one of the worst English accents. That's true. Yeah, That's true. one of the worst, but it didn't matter. Because his acting is so good. Right. Right. I don't know. 
Well, you got to work with Henry Thomas again on uh, yeah. on, on Haunting of Bly Manor. And well, and we actually got to like work together in, in Doctor Sleep. I'm just like, we're just recreating the bat scene for like five seconds, which yeah. was cool. I was like, oh my God, I'm swinging a bat at Henry Thomas. <laughs> And he was into it, man. That that, that role. Yeah, he was like all like into it. He was like really be really scary. He was like possessed <laughs> in that role. Oh my god! What do you enjoy most about working with Henry? Um, how do I put it into words? Like, I mean, Henry is is one of I think one of the greatest living American actors, and I think that he ought to be considered such by everybody. I don't, I mean, there's so many movies that I see where I'm like, Henry would be perfect in that. He would knock that out of the park. Um, and every time I work with him, it, it, it's interesting because he is so under the radar about stuff. Like, he's not a showy guy. He's not an attention whore. He really kind of just is very gentle and quiet and keeps to himself. And then you go and do a scene and it's like all this stuff comes out. That he is like, yeah, I worked on it in my trailer, and he's just like super humble about it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I just learned something about acting though just now. So, how did you do that? Yeah, it's it was really good. like and so generous. Like he just he just gives everything to you. Like like you feel like a bad person if you're not there with him, like giving it back to him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you kind of think he might not be ready, and then you, you you say action, and he's like, nails it. Nails, nails it. it, yeah. And and you're always in good hands, and like it's always a reciprocal experience. And which is also really cool, because I mean, he's been doing this for almost 40 years, and here I am, some like new girl, and so respectful, treated me like a peer immediately. I mean... Yeah, he's 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 a, an officer and a gentleman. Absolutely, and if anybody hasn't seen his portrayal of Norman Bates in Psycho Four, in Psycho check Four, it out. it's check it it's it's arresting. Yes, you know, and I think it's kind of bullshit that it's taken so long for horror to be recognized as a serious genre, whatever that means. Because I mean, there are some incredible performances performances that that blow any modern Academy Award nominee out of the water. Like, sure. but it's a horror movie. So it's like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a melodrama, you know, <laughs> not what? a horror, like, it's a what? horror Ingmar Bergman made a horror movie. Like, how are yeah. you about to get on your high horse about like war horse? Yeah. That's <laughs> Well, your, your your character of Charlotte went through many emotions. Uh, was there a scene that you recall that was a, a challenge to get into or to deliver? I mean, going into any scene that you know is going to be heavy and emotional and, like, you're expected to emote and you're expect. It's it's very it's always hard. There's always those moments of panic where you kind of get into your head and you're like, okay, I have I have to cry. I have to do this. I have to make sure I do that. And the biggest challenge is just kind of shoving all that away and turning off your brain and saying, listen, you already did your homework. You know where you're starting from, and you know who this person is. Do not plan anything. <laughs> Don't already decide where you're gonna go because then it will be false um and so you know that that that's usually i mean i think that's a challenge for for most actors i mean that's why you have all these different processes and techniques and like oh i gotta go and think about my dead dog for 30 minutes so that i can come back and you know like there's so much noise around like getting yourself to an emotional place when it's a trick it's a trap you don't want to do that. You want to have the inner monologue that your character has. You want to be thinking what they are thinking. And then the feelings just come. They just come because you're in it, because you believe it. They just come because they have to, because you can't stop them. Right. You know, I, I had an acting teacher, uh, a mentor, 
who would always say, you know, most people go through their lives trying to not feel things, trying to not show emotion in front of people. And when you, when you do that, it's a very human thing. And everyone has experienced this when the more you try to stop yourself from feeling something, the more it ha the more it builds and it has to come out like, okay, I'm not gonna, like, this just happened, but I'm not going to cry. And I'm going to keep it together. That almost makes you want to cry more. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and, and I think that, um, I think that it's, it's stuff like that, that kind of gets lost now. You know, it, yeah. I don't care if the actor is feeling something. I care if I'm feeling something watching them. I guess that's, that's why. I guess that's why method actors are so good. <laughs> is that a joke? I well. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand method actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a cliche at this point. You know, well, it's not but, just yeah. cliche. It's it's the fact that the method is so focused on. It's very, I've, I've always found it, and working with method actors, I've always found it to be very self-indulgent. Right. And not very generous. It's about me and what I'm feeling, what I have to do to get to where I need to be. Right. Instead of being in the moment, being with your scene partner and giving everything to them and being in honest reaction to them because you really are living truthfully under your imaginary circumstances, which is one of the main tenets of Meisner, the Meisner technique, which I prefer. I, I've tried them all. I should, I should preface this by saying I've studied the method. I've studied Meisner. I've studied Cell Adler, Larry Mox, Bonichovic. The list goes on. You've had a variety. You have. You must. I mean, you must. You must know what all the different ways in and and how honestly those teachers come by those those things. And, and one of my big problems with the method stems from the original teacher of the method, Lee Strasberg. Lee Strasberg, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is a complete narcissist. Um, he cares more about being a group than actually teaching something that is not only effective, but also healthy. The biggest problem with method is that it is not healthy. It's not healthy to dwell in real trauma that you have in order to cry and see. There are people, there are instances of people who have not come back from that. Um, you, that can lead to a psychological break in some people. Um, and it's not art <laughs> anymore. You must use your imagination. You don't, you know, like there's that famous story of um, when Dustin Hoffman was doing Marathon Man. Dustin Hoffman, brilliant actor, one of my favorites. Sure. He has all but disowned the method at this point um, and has apologized for his behavior on movies like Kramer vs. Kramer and, um, and, and others. I, I don't remember what it's, I, I think, like. Hopefully, not Straw Dogs. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but on Marathon Man, he was working with Sir Lawrence Olivier, one of the greatest, still, still one of the greatest actors of all time. And, you know, he was playing a guy who runs a marathon, so he was training to run a marathon. And he came to him said, he's all sweaty, and Lawrence Olivier said, what are you doing? Why are, why are you so uh, sweating that breath? Oh, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm playing, you know, someone running a marathon, so I'm, I'm training to run a marathon. So Lawrence Olivier said, well, you could just try acting. And that's, I think, kind of a brilliant insight on his part because, sure. you know, if you have to go and wash dishes for three months so that you know what it's like to be a dishwasher, I think you're focused on the wrong thing. It's not about whether or not you can convincingly wash a dish, it's whether or not you bring life to the person you're playing and you understand their inner life. Yeah. Now, if you have led a life of privilege and never washed a dish before somehow, then yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> or you've just never worked a shitty job in your life. Like, yeah, you should do that <laughs> just to be a complete person. You should do that. Like, you should a shitty job for someone you don't like and you have to do what they say anyway or else you don't survive. I mean, wow. I think wow. everyone that. 
acting one on one. Well, I mean, I, I do like to get on my soapbox, so take take what I say with a grain of salt. No, I think it's great. But, I mean, it's, it's very very true. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I find a lot of method actors it becomes about like what they did to get to do the role. I I gained weight, or I lost weight, or I abused my co-stars. Like, right. Or, That's what. It's it like. If, if anyone ever sent me a used condom or a bullet in the mail and I was working with them on a movie, I would fucking attack them on set. I yeah. would press them the fuck down in front of everyone. I know Will Smith hates this. He didn't get invited back for the second Suicide Squad. Yeah. <laughs> they had like some stand-in come in and shoot the back of his head and left him that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's just, it's not necessary. And also, now you have an actor who's making everything about them. So, so much for artistic collaboration. That goes right out the window. I mean, right. there's a reason why all of the best directors work with the same actors all the time. Sure. And the same crew. Yeah, they, you na- you nailed it. Yeah. yeah. It's for sure. Because there's an a, a air of collaboration. I mean, even someone like Bill Murray. Bill Murray is one of the most famous human beings of all time. Everyone loves him. He could easily make it all about him, whatever he's working on. But he doesn't. He has humility. Right. And he has faith in someone like Wes Anderson. As well he should. As he should, yes. Of course. As well he should. And he knows, so, so for him, it is about collaboration. It is about giving to something bigger than himself. Right. Which is the whole thing. I mean, again, actors love to make everything about themselves. It's about me. It's about my performance. It's about how I look. It's about how I, how I come across. It's about where my name is in the credits and all of this stuff. It's not about any of that shit. It's about right. serving the script, and that's it. You serve the script. Right. Your no team. No one serves you. Yeah. yeah. Great, great perspective. Great oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I Sorry, agree. I, that, know I got a little intense about it. No, no, that's why. That's why I mentioned. <laughs> the method, the method, I mentioned the method acting is, is sort of a joke because it's it's you know I I think it's just I think it's just insulting to every actor because every actor's in character you know but then well, they again, like, they realize oh, it's a character. What they did for this role, like right. I don't care what they did. I care if I believe them or like in like in the in the the Revenant where it's like oh Leo slept outside got ice in his beard. Like, yeah, and his assistant was next to him, and he was covered in bear fur, and it's like, no <laughs> one was leaving that guy alone in the woods. Give me a fucking break. <laughs> He's the lead in a multi-million dollar movie. Wow. No, I'm sorry. Like, I think it's really cute that he slept outside, so he would know what that feels like to sleep outside. But, but it's not, that's not authentic. That's well, and sure. that's not a reason to take his performance seriously. Right. You know? Agreed. And I think that De Niro kind of ruined it for everybody because he was so brilliant in, in Raging Bull. He was brilliant, brilliant in sure. it. And he gained all that weight for the end to make it more realistic. The question I pose to people who subscribe to the method or, or utilize it is, don't you think that you would be as capable of delivering that performance without all this extra bullshit? Without right. all of these extra steps of like, I'm so, just like so, I'm feeling it so hard. I'm just like totally immersed. It, it kind of reminds me of, um, of um, oh God, I, I just, I, it just screamed method actors to me when I saw it. Did you ever see the incredible Burt Wonderstone? I have not seen that. What? No, it's Such on my underrated list. Underrated comedy. Yeah. Steve I'm- Carell, Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi, maybe my favorite actor. Really? And- Wow. Oh my god, that there is nothing that guy can't do. And he is the least classically handsome actor maybe of all time. Yeah. But yeah. he can be a big swinging dick gangster in Boardwalk Empire with young hotties throwing themselves at him and you completely buy it. You completely buy it. He's a complete badass. And then he'll play Donnie in Lebowski, be totally diminished little bitch it's a like this guy has no ego in his work at all it is never it's always about the work it's always about that 
You're right. I yeah. think he's, I mean, he's just, he's, he's what all actors should aspire to be like. I think. Just watch, but, just, just watch Fargo. Just watch Fargo. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, for so many reasons. I mean, that's, that's some of the best work that, that a lot of those guys have done. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh. Well, well, Alex, what, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. Uh, okay. we're coming up on, on an hour and 20, but, um, in addition to Midnight Mass, can you tell us anything about that that you're able to say or, or anything else you have? I'm not words? allowed. I okay. said, I, I, I tried to say something really brief and obscure about it once, and like that was too much. Right. And I got a very stern talking to. So all I can say is it's a show about an island community where some weird stuff starts to happen. Great. Great, and, that, and that's supposed to air in the fall, correct? Yes, totally and I'm that. really excited. Great, and that's another Mike Flanagan project. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, and, and this is like, this is maybe my favorite thing of his. And this is a this is a project that he has he he wrote it seven years ago, as like a four hour movie or something like that, um, and then he then he broke it down into a, a, a limited series. Awesome. Um, and it's, it's an opus. I mean, it's very clearly like his baby. He's, he's put a lot of care into the story and the characters and, and it, he, he, he shot it with, you know, his, his all-star team, Michael Fuminari is DPing, uh, Troy Rag, Troy Wagner, excuse me, uh, is pulling focus, um, all, uh, I, God, I'm not gonna be able to name every single person, but. Well, hopefully the Newton brothers. The Newton brothers, of course. Okay. Yeah. And actually one of them has a little cameo oh, in cool. the show. And it's great. And he's great. Yeah. They make, make great the, music and I love their cookies. You know, the Fig Newton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're like two of the best guys. Like the sweetest, kindest, all like ray of sunshine kind of dudes. I agree. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll look for Midnight Mass this fall. Is there yeah. anything else out now or recently that came out that you can you want to talk about or mention? Uh, oh. Yeah, well, I pro <laughs> there's something I probably should mention. Uh, it's a movie called Faceless, and yes. I noticed that you had it in <laughs> the thing. I shot that in 2015. Wow, I, I just watched it recently. No way. Well, yeah. it only came out recently. Yeah. They... they they slept okay. on it for like six years. Yeah, I didn't think it was ever going to come out. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, it stars uh, Brendan Sexton. Yep. Who, uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, he was in Welcome to the Dollhouse. That was his one of his first projects, and it's one of my favorite movies. I think I still think it's Todd Salon's best movie. I, I like it even more than Happiness. Um, but I also saw it by accident when I was in like eighth grade and I just related to it so hard. Sure. I was like, oh, Wiener Dog. I'm sorry. I didn't see, I never saw Wiener Dog though. I heard it was not. I haven't seen that either. Yeah. But, but uh, okay. So, well, you guys can check out Faceless, which isn't new, but it is new. It's not new. And honestly, like, it's not my best work. Just heads up. <laughs> it's really not the best thing I've ever done. Right. Well, uh, you, we we work together on the horror cons. Can you mention what you like most? Favorite aspect about attending a horror con? Oh, I mean, I love. Well, I mean, I, I, this is going to sound like such a stock answer, but it's so true. I really do love meeting people who like what I do. Yeah, it's incredibly validating, and um, it, I I don't know. I mean, I feel lucky. I I have really sweet, lovely fans. And they're always really respectful, and they're always very genuine, and it's always it's always just like a really nice experience. You get to chat with people, and you know, people will tell me like about their lives, and it's amazing. I mean, it's just it's 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 really cool. I love doing cons. Yeah, well, and you give a, you give the you know that back to them because I've seen your energy and generosity, oh. and and you really do. I mean, there's there's times where you know a line's forming, and I'm like Alex. Been six minutes with this person, like with people behind. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Anyway, I'm gonna follow you on Instagram. Everything goes well. <laughs> right, right. Well, you guys can look at fullempirepromotions.com to see where where Alex is going to be appearing. We've got a couple conventions coming up soon. 
So I am going to wrap up by asking you a question that I ask everyone I talk to. Okay. Yes, and it's probably going to put you on the spot, but I think you'll have, okay, some, I think you'll have some answers ready. I think you I will. love it. Um, if you could pick any film to star in, uh, anybody to star in a film with you, any actor to be the lead with you, and any director to direct it, who would you pick? And there's two caveats. They have to okay. still be still be living. Oh, okay. And they have to be people you've never worked with. Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> I'm still I'm still in the early stages. Um, okay. Ooh. I mean, there's one person I could say that's a little provocative, but I really do feel that way. But oh no, 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 no. I know. Okay. Uh Steve Buscemi with the Cohen brothers. Oh. There you go. There you go. I don't throwing, think it would get much better than that. Oh, that or, or can I have a second one? This go is the it. other dream. Dream. Daniel Day, P.T. Anderson. Oh. Take some good combos there. I mean, I don't know if I could ever <laughs> do what Vicky Creeps did, because she is... I don't know why she's not in the lead in everything now. I mean, maybe it's because she's Belgian or something. Well, she's a genius. She, she, I, I have not been that excited about a new actor in such a long time. Well, we're throwing that out there in the universe. Yeah. Those two things. Well, Alex, it's been it's been a lot of fun chatting with you. I enjoyed uh, getting to know a little bit more about you. And, Thank uh, thanks, you, Dom. Thanks to everybody who watched us live. We're going to wrap <laughs> this one up, but uh, if you'd like to chat with Alex, we're going to be doing Zoom sessions in about 10 minutes. So head over to fullempirepromotions.com and uh, book your session. Yeah. All right, Alex. Thanks a lot. We'll see you soon. Okay, see you soon, man. Thanks, thanks a lot, you guys. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys, to everybody who joined us. I uh, hope you enjoyed the Q&A. You got some acting lessons there from Alex's, too. A little bonus. Um, we're working on pulling together the next virtual event, but we are picking up. Things are getting busy again, luckily, at the cons. So we are doing a heavy travel schedule coming up. But uh, we'll try to do at least one of these per month, if time allows. But I am reminding you that uh, you can go to fullempirepromotions.com if you want to interact personally with Alex on Zoom, as well as get signed autographs. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks so much, guys, and have a great weekend.